um, we're going to take a step back today because um, there's something that I talked briefly about last time that I don't think I devoted sufficient time to. So we're going to go back and cover that in more detail. And that is the idea of a constructor. So we talk about constructors in Java. Uh, what do we mean by that? A constructor is like a function, similar to a function, all right? But what it essentially does is it makes an object from the class. In other words, the class is a template of an entity in our problem. So we have a pizza class in our example. The class that we have for pizza is a template for all the pizzas. In other words, everything that we're interested in about a pizza is contained in this pizza class. All right. This is kind of a simplified version and we could expand it. But to start, we're saying that, that a pizza has a crust. A pizza has a uh, size. A pizza has, whether it has pepperoni or not, true or false. And then we can calculate how long it will take to bake this pizza. And we can calculate how much the price of this pizza is. So this is generic. This is for all pizzas that will ever be created. However, we can create an individual instance of the pizza object and then set the variables for that and then ask for that particular pizza what is the price? How much is it? How long does it take to bake? And so on. Think of it this way, you know, if we were building an application for a college, a student would be uh, a class and it would contain all the attributes that we want to know about a student, you know, their first name, their last name, their student number, uh, their email address, probably their address, phone number, and so on. All right. However, you are an instance of that class. You're a member of that class. In other words, you are a specific student, one specific student. So that's the difference between a class and an object. An object represents one member of the class, all right, or one instance of that class. Whereas a class is sort of a template for uh, for um, for what we have uh, uh, for what we have uh, the class is a template and the instance is an individual object. So we have to make an object and we make an object from the class. We say, you know, we talk about pizzas. Here, make a pizza, make an object that represents one specific pizza. And it's a constructor's job to do that. All right. Now, if you look at the pizza class, we don't have anything in here that is a constructor. All right. If you refer to my lecture last week, you'll see what a constructor looks like. Well, this doesn't have any of that. If you don't define a constructor, the compiler inserts a constructor for you. And that constructor accepts no arguments. So, in the unit test where we create a pizza, we have this statement. And there's so much packed into this one simple statement. All right. Pizza with the parentheses after it is the constructor that we're calling. Now that is not defined in the pizza class. The compiler, however, will generate it because we do not have any, we do not have any uh, pizzas of that class or we don't have any constructors for pizza. 
to reopen these supplements. All right, because we've not defined a constructor in the pizza class, this statement calls the default no argument constructor that the compiler inserts into the pizza class. We then call our set methods to set the different attributes. Remember, our attributes are going to be private, at least for now. The way that we access and retrieve the attributes is through these methods. So a set method gives the attribute a value. What value? Well, the argument. So this one is going to set size to L. So what does that function do? We call set size. We pass it an L. The size of this pizza is determined to be L. Likewise, the crust is thin because when we call the method set crust, we give it a value of thin. And therefore it sets the crust to thin. And finally, has pepperoni is set to the value of that Boolean to be true. We then, in our unit test, output some things. We call the get methods. The get methods retrieve the values of those properties. And then we call the function to calculate the bake time and the function to calculate the price. So let's actually do that. We run this and the piece is large. Then has pepperoni. The bake time is 10 minutes and the price is $14. Let's make sure that's right. You know, we get to play computer and, and, and look and see, is that the answer we were expecting? Well, for calculate bake time, if the crust is thin, the bake time is 10. So yeah, the crust is thin, so the bake time is 10. For the price, is the pizza small, medium, or large? It's large. So we start out the price at two. If it has pepperoni, we add, or 12 rather. If it has pepperoni, we add two to it. That means 14. If the crust is thick, we add an additional dollar. Well, it isn't, so we don't add that additional dollar. So we have 12 plus two of, or 14. So this calculates out. Now, this is not enough to test this program because we could have a problem for medium or small, or if it doesn't have pepperoni, you'd have to, you'd actually have to test this a bunch of times to verify that. Uh, I would think there's 18 combinations that you would need to test to thoroughly test this and make sure that the calculations are correct. All right. Now, let's look at this one line. The one that I says contains a lot of stuff to unpack. Pizza P1 equals new pizza. All right. I'm going to draw a diagram of sort of what goes on in this instruction. So I'm going to use this as my whiteboard. I'll expand it this way. There we go. All right. Now, 
we create our Java source file. That is our source file. This is our .java file. We compile it. I have a little too much luck today here. All right, we have our Java source file or files. They end in dot Java. By the way, that should be lowercase dot Java. I had a student who turned it in, and in Windows, that would work out fine. If you compile it on another operating system, it won't work. We run it through the instruction Java to compile it. That produces the class files, the dot class files. You can see those here. We compiled the Java source, these two files, and we produce these files, the dot class files. All right. We then have something called the Java virtual machine. The class file is in what's called bytecode. So that is not geared to any specific hardware. The Java virtual machine is geared to a particular hardware. In other words, we have a Java virtual machine for Mac OS, a Java virtual machine for Windows and so on. So that takes this class file and executes it. It actually sort of translates the stuff in the bytecode and the class file to actual machine language, and that runs. Now, if you're going to look at the Java virtual machine, there's two parts of its memory. There's the stack, and there is the heap. All right? I hope this will all come together and make sense. So there's a stack and there's the heap. So what happens when we execute this statement? Pizza P1 equals new pizza. What that does is this. It creates a pointer called P1. That's going to point to a location on the heap where the actual pizza object appears. So let's say this is memory location 500 in the heap. P1 then would contain a pointer to that 500. All right. So this statement. One statement creates a pizza object on the heap, creates a pizza object on the heap, and assigns the pointer P1 to point to that object. All right. So let's say I say P2 equals P1. What happens there? Well, I'm going to get another variable called P2 that's also going to point to location 500. Because when we refer to the variable P1, we're actually referring to the pointer to the object, not the object itself. So if I were to say in here, pizza P1, P2 equals P1 that's not creating a new pizza object because we did not call the pizza constructor, which is what this is. 
new pizza in parentheses is calling the constructor. It doesn't create a new pizza object. So no new pizza object is created on the heap. However, a new pointer called P2 is pointed to that first original object that we had in memory location 500. So if I were to change all these, the P2, Guess what we got? We get the identical results. So it doesn't matter if we refer to P2 or P1. Why? Because both of them point to the same object. So all the objects contains the size, the crust, and whether it has pepperoni or not, is stored in this object on the heap. The pointer, all the pointer does is point to that pizza and say, when you refer to P2, you're talking about this pizza. When you uh, are talking about P1, you mean also this pizza, because they both point to the memory location. So, creates a new pizza object on the heap is this part. New pizza create, creates a new pizza object and it puts it in the heap. The other half says it's going to put it in a pointer called P1. Now, we have to put it in a pointer that can handle a pizza. In other words, if I say this, we're going to get an error. We get a bunch of errors, actually. Because the reason we get an error is because we can't store the pointer to a pizza object in a string object. This creates the pizza object. We're trying to set P1 as a pointer to that pizza object. Well, if we define that, that this pointer is a type string, we can't set a pointer to a pizza object into a variable that's defined as a string. So this has to be pizza. We'll see exceptions to this later on, but for now, it would have to be pizza. Any questions over this? Go back to where we were before. Now this means we have to be careful. Watch what I do here. I'm going to create a new pizza called P3. And I'm going to set the size to large. I'm going to set the crust to thin. I'm going to set the has pepperoni boolean to true. And I'm going to compare to see if they're equal. I'm going to see if P1 is equal to, to P2. Otherwise, the 
print out that P1 does not equal P2. And we're gonna do the same thing to pizza one and pizza three. Now just think for a second, ask yourself, and I'll pause for a second and give you a second to think about this. You don't have to answer, and but those of you watching this at home and those of you that watch the video, take a second and think about it. What will these if statements say? Is P1 equal to P2? Is P1 equal to P3? And this is the code we have. All right, let's find out. Uh, we forget to save something. Yeah, we did. We get P1 is equal to P2, but P1 is not equal to P3. All right. Let's see if this makes sense to you, and let's think about what this is saying. We first come in and create the pizza P1, and we say that's put in memory location 500. And and the pointer to that memory location is stored at P1. We then say P2 equals P1. So we set the pointer of P2 to be the same as the pointer that's in P1. So they both are pointing to pizza, pizza object that is in 500. Now we come along and create a new pizza. This means that this is a new pizza on the heap. All right. So there's a brand new pizza. So there's two pizzas on the heap now. We set the size equal to size, the crust equal to the value of crust, the, the what it has pepperoni, we set that the same. Now, let's say that object we created called P3 is stored in memory location 600. And the pointer P3 points to location 600. When we do a comparison to say, is this equal to that? We are literally doing, asking if they are the same object. We're not comparing the contents of the objects on the heap. We're comparing the values of the pointers. And P1 equals P2, so it prints out that P1 is equal to P2. In this case, however, they point to different objects, even though everything about them is the same. All right? Same value for the size, same value for the crust, same value for has pepperoni, all right? Yet, this says that they're not equal. When you're doing an, a comparison of equal, and if you're in, involving objects, equal means do they point to the same object? And in this case, they do. In this case, they don't. Now, this is how objects work. Primitives are much easier. Primitives are variables, if I declare like an integer or an n, that equals one, two, three. That's stored on the stack, and there's nothing to point to on the heap. And if I create another integer and give it a value of one, two, three, if I compare them, it's going to val compare the value of this integer with the value of that integer, and it's going to tell me that they're the same. But it doesn't work that way with objects. When you ask if objects are equal, you are asking, do they point to the same object? And they don't. How do you know they don't? Because this points to this object, 
This points to that brand new object that was created here. This is important. This is critical. All right, to understanding and do object oriented programming. So, getting back to the original point about constructors, we have nothing in the pizza class that is a constructor. Therefore, the Java compiler inserts a constructor in there. Inserts, a, inserts an instruct or a constructor with no arguments called, you know, that doesn't set any of these values. All it does is it creates the object on the heap and allows us to store the pointer of it. So, no constructor, the compiler inserts a constructor for you with no arguments. And all it does is it creates an empty object. It doesn't set any of the values. Now, Notice this in the unit test. Let's look at these four lines of code. We're creating the object and we're setting three of the attributes. Well, the only three attributes that we have, right? We're setting attribute size, crust, and has pepperoni, right? It would be nice if we could do that in just one statement. It'd be nice if we could just say pizza one equals new pizza, blah, 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 and have it do that. So, let's move to our other directory here. I have the same classes. I can compile them. And execute them. Unit test has the main method, so that's the one that I run. I get this answer. But let's look at what we have in the pizza class now. So let's go into this other folder and open up the code. In this class, we have a constructor. Let's see the constructor. It's right here. How do I know that that's a constructor? There's two things that give it away. It looks like a function, right? But it has the exact same name as the name of the class. So that tells you that this is a constructor. It's not a regular method or function. The other thing that sort of gives it away that this is a constructor is there's no return value. In other words, this doesn't return something. This simply creates the object of the type that we want it to. And notice that we have three arguments here. All right. This will allow us in the unit test To in one line, create and set those attributes. Whereas if you remember in the previous example, we had one line to create the object and then one line to set the size, one line to set the uh, crust and one line to set whether it has pepperoni or not. So how does this work? Well, we call the constructor 
the compi the compiler is going to look to see if there's a pizza constructor that accepts two strings and a boolean. All right, the the values that you give the constructor has to match the values that the constructor is expecting. And if we look at this, the constructor is expecting a string, a string, and a boolean. All right, so far so good. What it's going to do then is whatever's in the first value is going to be put in the first variable. So L is going to be put in arg size. Then it's going to be put in arg crust. And has pepperoni is going to be put in the variable arg has pepperoni. Okay. So what do we do? We set the attribute called size to the value of the argument. We set the attribute for crust to the value of the crust argument, the value of has pepperoni to the value of the argument. So now we've gotten these variables passed in as, as arguments to the constructor. We use those to set these variables. And other than that, the rest of it works just like before. This works identical to calling the set function with a value of L, the set function with a value of thin, and the set function with a value of true. The set function for the size, the set function for the crust, the set function for it has pepperoni. It's identical to what we had in the previous example. Let's pull that up just to remind us what we had in the previous example. We call it with no arguments, and we set these variables this way. Whoops, let me do that. That's equivalent of doing this. But as you can see, it's all on one line. It's, it's a little neater code. All right. Now, here's the way that that automatic constructor works. If you haven't defined any constructors, you get for free, without doing anything, you get the constructor that contains no arguments. Now that we have defined a constructor, uh, constructor on pizza, though, the compiler no longer is going to insert the no argument constructor, which means that if we do this, we do this, is that going to work or not? Think. For a second, is that going to work or not based on what I've said? It does not. Why? Because we've declared a constructor on the pizza class, and we're trying to call a constructor with no arguments. You get that constructor if you don't define any constructors, but you don't get that constructor if you have already defined another constructor. So I could do this. I could define a, a uh, constructor with no arguments if I wanted to. And I could either not set any of the attributes or I could default them. I'm going to not define any attributes. Uh, I'm not going to set any of the attributes. Now what I have works fine. Because even though I call the no argument constructor, I myself defined the no argument constructor, so that's okay. 
So you can have more than one constructor. And I'll show you in a minute what we use more than one constructor for. Right. Now, if we think about it, we think about it, we kind of have to know these three things to know what kind of pizza to make in our, the way we've defined a pizza, with the size, with the crust, and whether it has pepperoni or not. So we probably wouldn't do this, right? I can have, however, a second constructor that accepts two arguments, let's say. Let's say it accepts the size and the crust. but doesn't accept whether it has pepperoni or not. What I could do in order to make sure these three get defined, I could define a default value. So I'm going to say pepperoni is false. So this is okay because this argument list is different than this argument list. Here we have three arguments, string, string, Boolean. Here we have two arguments, string, string. So I could go here actually, and I could call that two argument constructor. It's gonna know what constructor to use. Why? It's going to use the, it's going to know to use a constructor that has two string arguments because it's giving two string arguments. So let me save that. And compile. And run it. Now this time, notice this doesn't have pepperoni. Why not? Well, you look at the constructor. The two argument constructor defaults pepperoni to false. And that's one of the ways, one of the reasons why we have multiple constructors, because it allows us to choose default values for some of our attributes. So if we give it three arguments, then it's going to use this function. Now, the number of arguments and the type of arguments have to match up. So it's not just the fact that I have two arguments. I have two arguments that are both strings. So if I try to do this, trust me on this. Lays taste like when you're If I had tried to do this, Think what you think is going to happen. It's an error. Why is that? Well, because the second argument in the two argument constructor is a string and you can't convert a Boolean to a string. So when you call the constructor, it has to match the number of arguments and the type of arguments. Now, I could write a second constructor, or third constructor actually, in pizza that accepted the size and whether it has pepperoni or not, and default the crust to thin. This will work. So I can do that and run it. Oh. Anyone see the problem with that? No quotes. This is a string, so I put quotes around it. Not just the word then. And 
and I run it and it defaulted it to thin, it set pepperoni to false, just like we expected it to. Now, I'm going to write a, another constructor and ask you if you think it will work or not. And when I finish this, tell me if you think it would work. Could I write another constructor that accepts the trust So now I write a second constructor that uh, accepts the crust and the whether it has a pepperoni or not, and default the size to something. You think this will work? And the correct answer is. No, it won't. All right. Why won't it work? It won't work because we already have a constructor that accepts a string and a Boolean. We cannot have two constructors that have the exact number and types of arguments. This is true, by the way, of other functions. We can do what's called function overloading, where we have a function and we have the same function with the same name, but it accepts a different number of arguments. Uh, one example of that is we could have, if we had a, uh, a rectangle class, we could accept the height and width as arguments. We can then, uh, so we have a two argument constructor on the rectangle class. We could have a one argument constructor that accepted a value and use the same value for width and length. In other words, for a square, All right? So we have two integers or one integer. That's legit, but we could not have a function that had uh, that that used the same number and type of arguments. So we have to pick one of what we're going to use in order to get this to work. This is really important to understand, all right? Uh, I think last time I, I didn't go over constructors in a lot of detail. I, I maybe explained briefly what they did, but it's really important to understand this on a, on a nuts and bolts level. And the whole idea of creating multiple uh, constructors and so on. In this case, the assumption sort of was Gee, when I create a pizza, it better have a size crust and pepperoni. Therefore, I only allow me to write, I've only created functions that will set all three of the values in here. I don't have one that uh, only accepts, uh, that is a no argument that doesn't set any of the uh, attributes. So you can have multiple constructors as long as they have different number or type of arguments. So we'll probably come back to the concept of pointers and objects versus primitives in other classes, but this is an uh, introduction to them. Are there any questions? All right, we'll either see you uh, in lab or see you next week.